Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. O Master who loves mankind, illuminate our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your holy scriptures. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon a spiritual life and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God, and to you we give glory together with your Father and your all-holy, gracious, and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. The homily of St. John Chrysostom, the Paschal homily of St. John Chrysostom. Let all pious men and all lovers of God rejoice in the splendor of this feast. Let the wise servants blissfully enter into the joy of their Lord. Let those who have borne the burden of Lent now receive their pay. And those who have toiled since the first hour, let them now receive their due reward. Let any who came after the third hour be grateful to join in the feast. And those who might have come after the sixth, leave them not in doubt, for they shall sustain no loss. Those who have delayed until the ninth hour, let them not hesitate. Let them also come. And those who only came at the eleventh hour, let them not be afraid of being too late. For the Lord is gracious, and He receives the last even as the first. He gives, the rest, he gives rest to Him who comes at the eleventh hour as well as Him who has toiled since the first. Yes, He has pity on the last and He serves the first. He re- rewards the one and is generous to the other. He repays the deed and praises the effort. Come ye all, enter into the joy of the Lord. Ye first and ye last, receive alike your reward. Ye rich and ye poor, dance together. Ye sober and weakling, celebrate the day. Ye who have kept the fast and ye who have not, rejoice today. The table is richly laden. Fare ye royally on it. The calf is a fatted one. Let no one go away hungry. Enjoy you all the banquet of faith. Receive you all the riches of His goodness. Let no one grieve over his poverty, for the universal kingdom has been revealed. Let no one weep over his sins, for forgiveness has shone from the grave. Let no one fear death, for the death of our Savior has set us free. He destroyed it by enduring it. He has despoiled Hades when he descended into its kingdom. He has angered it by allowing it to taste of his flesh. When Isaiah foresaw this, he cried out, Thou, O Hades, has been angered by encountering him below. It is angered for it is frustrated. It is angered for it is made to be mockery. It is angered for it is destroyed. It is angered for it is annihilated. It is angered for it is now made captive. It seized a body and lo, it discovered God. And it received earth and beheld. Behold, it encountered heaven. It seized the visible and was overcome by the invisible. O death, where is thy sting? O Hades, where is thy victory? Christ is risen and thou art abolished. Christ is risen and the demons are cast down. Christ is risen and the angels rejoice. Christ is risen and life is freed. Christ is risen and the tomb is emptied of the dead. For Christ, having risen from the dead, is become the leader and reviver of those who have fallen asleep. To Him be glory and power unto ages of ages. Amen. Christ is risen. risen. Our discussion this evening, I wanted to open with that Paschal homily of St. John Christendom because it is so famous. Is that the first time you've heard it? No. Okay, a few of you. Yes, it is so famous uh, in the history of... Christianity that in the eastern part of the world, among the eastern Christian churches, no priest dares to give a homily on Easter Sunday. He simply reads the words of St. John Chrysostom. 
across the entire eastern part of the Christian world. Um, we we're going to take a little bit different approach tonight, um, and that is that uh, we're going to look at a historical, try to take an historical account. What, where did Jesus go? Who did he talk to after the resurrection? Uh, what took place first, second, third, and fourth? It's a bit confusing, and I'm not going to pretend as though I can give all the answers to it. I think the first question is to ask, what is an, ap- an appearance? How does God reveal himself? Um, and we know that he reveals himself in many ways. Certainly, the empty tomb is an aspect of the resurrection of Christ, an aspect of the appearance or revelation of his resurrection. Uh, the angels also, or the stone rolled away, can also be accounted as revelations of his resurrection. And therefore, uh, if we take these things into account, it's a little bit easier to give an account of what took place first, second, and third. Um, but ultimately, that's not our primary purpose um, in reading the accounts, for there's something deeper that the authors want us to understand. There are certainly uh, contradictions or apparent contradictions. We're told that in one account that Jesus appeared to Peter first. In another account that he appeared to the women. In another account that he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. And of course, tradition tells us that he appeared to none of those first, but to the mother of God. For he ran first to his mother to console her tears. I'll share with you a little um, insight by an author who is writing a commentary on the, um, the, epistle, or the, the, the Gospel of Luke, but I think he, his, his insight can be applied to all of the Gospels. I've shared it with you before, some of you. He says, in writing these things in the way that he did, it is Luke's intention, and here we'll take their intention, the, the, the Gospel writer's intention, that we too, their readers, see what has taken place so that our hearts too will be converted. They intend to get their readers fully involved in the mystery of Christ which they present. They want us to see what the centurion saw, what the crowds who were moved to beat their breast saw. They want us to be present with the women who saw the tomb and how His body was laid when Jesus was buried. They want us to be with these women on the morning of His resurrection when they see the empty tomb and then in faith see the living one. They want us to see the Lord in the breaking of the bread with the disciples of Emmaus. And their eyes were opened and they recognized Him. They want us to be there looking on with faith when Jesus says to the disciples on the night of His resurrection, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. This is a a, a wonderful, beautiful insight that I think we do well to take to heart. We too often read the Scriptures or hear them proclaimed in the Gospel and the church from a distance as outsiders. We cannot do that. For the purpose of the Gospel is to be an invitation. An invitation to become followers of Jesus. To stand there, as the author says, to stand there with the women. Not to just stand there with the women, but to go late at night while it is still dark before the sun has risen. I've spoken with you before about this, and I hope you've taken me seriously about always going to the Easter Vigil. I know it's long and it's and so forth. If you didn't do it this year, I'll pray that you live to see another Easter so that you can go while it is still dark with the women to go there to the tomb weeping with desire in your heart to see the one whom you love. For those that go and remain and have that desire will certainly see what they hope to see. I want to begin this evening by contextualizing the resurrection accounts. And in order to contextualize the the, the accounts, I think it's a good good practice always. How many of you keep a little uh, map in your Bible? Some of you? 
Oh, please raise your hands. Okay. You got to have a little map. You know where things happened. You can't just say, well, okay, fine. He appeared to Mary Magdalene in a garden. Um, or he went to Bethany. That's nice Bible talk. That's not really telling me about my spiritual life. Wrong. If you want to be able to read the Scriptures with profit, you have to be willing to slow down and do a little investigative reporting to get the context of the scene, to see what it looks like to stand there with the women, to walk with Jesus to the mount, to the mountain where He would ascend, to go down to the water on the Sea of Galilee and stand on the shore and see Peter swimming toward Christ to smell the charcoal fire as it's burning. We must be willing to be there. And to be there, you have to be able to see what's going on. And so I want to contextualize it for you and and, and share with you right here at the beginning a quotation from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraphs 115 and 116 if you're taking notes. Paragraph 115 and 116. According to an ancient tradition, one can distinguish between two senses of Scripture the literal and spiritual. The latter, the spiritual, being subdivided into allegorical, moral, and anagogical, or typological. The profound concordance of the four senses guarantees all its richness of the living reading of Scripture in the church. The literal sense is the meaning conveyed by the words of Scripture and discovered by exegesis following the rules of sound interpretation. All other senses of Scripture are based on the literal. I like to call the literal sense of Scripture a literal historical. What's the author trying to tell you? Before you go and apply it to your spiritual life, which is the big mistake most of us make, I think, right? We open our Bibles and we want it to speak beautiful words of wisdom to us. And unfortunately, we open to the book of Leviticus. Okay? <laughs> Or even to the resurrection accounts. What is going on? What is going on here? And unless we understand the the literal historical aspect, we're not going to understand and be able to apply it in its spiritual sense, morally and to our lives and how we're going to learn from it spiritually. No, first, the literal historical sense. What did the author mean? And I think the most foundational thing you can do is get a basic sense of of geography. The second contextual point I want to give you um, is to understand the resurrection, really to understand the passion of Christ, the resurrection, um, the ascension 40 days later and 50 days later Pentecost, all in the context of the Jewish festal cycle. It's very important that we understand what's going on in Jerusalem. You think that's important? And Jesus didn't just go there out of the blue. He chose this moment and He chose this city. Okay, He chose Passover when He would pass over from death to life to bring our human nature back into the presence of God. But Passover begins also another part of the Jewish festal cycle and that is the Feast of Weeks. The beginning of the counting toward Pentecost. 50 days after the resurrection is the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost was a Jewish festival. Okay? And Jesus chose that day intentionally to send down the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And He spent all of these days purposefully within the context of this feast. In fact, it was the day of the resurrection that the Jews celebrated the Feast of First Fruits. And on the day in which Jesus was arrested and bound in the Garden of Gethsemane on that same mountain, the Jews were accustomed to binding a sheaf of barley, which would then be cut down and brought to the temple and offered before the Lord as the first fruits of the harvest. Passover's in spring, isn't it? What happens in spring in weather like that? Well, the, you, if you're, who's from California here? I mean, how fast do the, do the, does the wheat grow? It's almost immediate, right? And barley's the fastest. It springs up. 
And so while it springs up, they would bind that, that barley and they would cut it down, all preparing to bake it later in the festival cycle and offer it to the Lord. But they would take this first bound sheaf of barley and bring it into the temple and wave it before the Lord as a sacrificial offering. As we talked about before in my last talk I gave, where were we? At St. We were somewhere else. St. Timothy's? St. Timothy's? About the nature of sacrifice. Sacrifice is making something holy. Sacrifice has nothing to do with death and destruction. It has to do with dedicating the thing to God, making it holy. Sacrificere. This is a sacrifice which knew nothing of death and blood. As one scholar tells us, on Passover, a marked sheaf of grain was bundled and left standing in the field. On the next day, the first day of unleavened bread, the sheaf was cut and prepared for offering on the third day. On this third day, the priest waved the sheaf before the Lord, counting the days, then begins and continues until the day after the seventh Sabbath, the fiftieth day, which is called Pentecost. This would place the resurrection on the day of of the offering of the first fruits. Why is this important? Because the Jews believed that in the coming messianic age, all sacrifices would cease except the todah sacrifice, the thanksgiving sacrifice. Literally in Greek, the Eucharistic sacrifice. This sheaf waving or offering of barley would continue while well, all the blood sacrifices of the Old Testament would cease when the Messiah came. And sure enough, that is what happened. Do you think I'm taking it too far? I'd like to ask you to open your Bibles. You all brought Bibles tonight, I hope. To 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. And we're going to look at chapter 15, verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that He raised Christ whom He did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are all men most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Do you see, St. Paul understood that Jesus chose to rise from the dead specifically on the Feast of First Fruits, that He would show Himself to be the fulfillment of the old law. Not a waving of dead barley, but an offering, a sacrificial thanksgiving, Eucharistic offering of the Son of God. Jesus is the first fruits of the new law. That gives us maybe a little bit of an introduction and context. And we'll come back to this idea later about the Thanksgiving offering um, and the offering of the first fruits. I'm going to be quoting a few times from Bargell Pixner uh, with Jesus in Jerusalem, a, 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 just a wonderful book, and I'd recommend it to all of you. In his section, Jesus is alive, He is risen. Jesus is alive, He has risen. Out of this reality, the case for Jesus continued. Out of this, the church lives. Since the resurrection and the apparitions of Jesus represent the historical, mystical experience of a completely new and very different spiritual reality, they belong to a category that is beyond a purely human grasp. We might say they belong to the sphere of a fifth dimension, which is beyond the reach of our limited human capability as we only are able to perceive four four dimensions, 
three dimensions of space plus time. The reports of the witnesses as presented by the different evangelists are therefore not easily arranged, neither factually nor chronologically. And here is, I think, an extremely important uh, uh, thing to keep in mind. That when Jesus rises from the dead in His human nature, and His human nature is fully present to God, now the limitations of this world are no longer containing Him. He is not bound by time. He is not bound by space. He can at one moment eat and at the next walk through a wall. He can appear in two or three or more places at once. Our perception of truth is dependent upon our ability to perceive within the context of this of these dimensions in which we were created. But when Jesus rises from the dead, He introduces a whole new dimension. And so when we read the accounts of the Gospels, it certainly can come across from our perception as confusing and even in sometimes contradictory. But discrepancies are resolved, I believe, in charity and understanding. And most important, to understand what the purpose of the text was. That when an author is writing to a Gentile audience, as St. Paul was writing to the Corinthians, and even to a Jewish audience, and says that Jesus appeared not to a woman first, but to Peter, he does so because at that time, in that culture, women were just not trusted Their word was not authoritative. And I'll stop right here in case I forget to say it later, but if I remember later, I'll say it a second time. And that is, shame on modern society for claiming that Christianity oppresses women. For it is Jesus who restores the dignity of women, who appears first to a woman, and ask the woman to go and proclaim the most important truth that has ever been proclaimed in this world. It is Jesus who raises up the dignity of a woman who has been oppressed by a non-Christian society. I think I made my point clear. (laughs) The basic story. After the Sabbath, the women go to the tomb and they see the stone is rolled back. They see an angel, or they see two angels. They see an angel in one account outside the tomb, in another account inside the tomb. On the way, uh, sorry, after seeing the angels, they run from the tomb to tell the apostles. And on the way, some of the women see Christ, who tells them to tell the apostles to go to Galilee. Peter and John run to the tomb and find it empty. But Mary Magdalene remains at the tomb and sees the resurrected Lord. Peter also sees Christ while returning from the tomb sometime that day, sometime that afternoon of the first Easter morning. Two disciples later on that evening on the road to Emmaus see Christ and they return to Jerusalem. Christ then appears to ten of them. Thomas is not with them. And He eats with them and breathes upon them. Eight days later, Christ appears to the eleven while Thomas is there and speaks and says, put your hands in My side. The apostles then go to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus directed them. Christ appears there to 500 people and also appears on the sea to the apostles. They return to Jerusalem where James, the brother of the Lord, sees Him. And then Jesus leads them up the mount to Bethany and ascends into heaven. All of the Gospels tell us that toward dawn or er very early in the morning or at early dawn or while it was still dark, the women went to the tomb. Very few details of the resurrection 
are reported in all four accounts. But this fact is reported. Why? It places us right at the beginning of the revelation of the resurrection in a broader context. And that broader context is the context of creation. I would like you to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, as I always have you do. And I want you to just repeat with me or see with me at the end of the first day in verse 5. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. At the end of verse 8, and there was evening and morning the second day. At the end of verse 13, and there was evening and there was morning a third day. At the end of verse 20, and there was evening and morning a fifth day. Did I skip one? Sorry, verse 19. And there was evening and morning a fourth day, fine, and then a fifth day. And in verse, um, and in verse, uh, coming all the way to verse 31, and there was evening and there was morning a sixth day. Do you get a theme? But look at the seventh day. Which verse tells us that there was evening and morning the next day? Show me. No, it's not there. On the day in which Adam and Eve fell, there was no end. The Sabbath, as reported in Genesis, was not complete. For there was no true resting of man in the heart of God. All four Gospel accounts tell us that the Sabbath was ended. And early on the next day, Jesus rose from the dead. Placing the resurrection of Christ in its proper context, in the context of the restoration of the fall of Adam and Eve. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to have to go fast because I'm already being shown time cards. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. We're told in the other accounts, in addition to Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, that Salome was also with them. Or Salome. The other Mary, we're told, is Mary the mother of James. We're told also that Joanna was with them in the Gospel of Luke. And the other women that were with them. Mary Magdalene in the Gospel of John is reported as going alone. But when she runs to tell the apostles, she does not say that I have seen that the tomb is empty. She says that we, they have taken away the Lord and we do not know where they have laid Him. A whole group of women went to the tomb early in the morning while it was still dark. Not escorted by other men. And let me ask you a question. How was it that they all came together in the middle of the night while it was still dark? How was it that they decided then to go to the tomb of Christ together while it was still dark with no cell phones and no GPS and no alarm clock to wake them up? Look at Luke chapter 24 with me. And you can keep your hand if you want on Matthew 28. Uh, Put a little piece of paper there. We'll be going back to it. In Luke chapter 24... I'm sorry. Well, fine. Look at chapter 24, verse 1, but I'm not going to read that to you. Go up one verse to chapter 23 and go to verse 25, actually. The women had come with them from Galilee, followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Do you see that? And verse 56. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath day, they rested according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb. You see, when they left the tomb of Christ, they didn't all go back to their own homes. 
No, in fact, they were women of Galilee. Mary was from Magdala. It is believed they went back to the upper room where also the apostles were staying in the Essene quarter and where they would remain and see Jesus on the eighth day after the resurrection, where they would also return and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How was it that they all got up in the middle of the night before the sun rose and went to the tomb? I will tell you, because they could not sleep. They were so distraught by what had taken place. Their hearts were burning, if only to be in the presence of His dead body and to anoint it with oil. I have some oil which they anointed Jesus' body with, the same mixture they anointed it with. It's an astringent which will burn the skin and seal it when the body is anointed. It's a preservative. You can still get it in Jerusalem. And its smell is so fragrant, it's amazing. Some of you have been there with me and, and smelled that oil. They went home and they prepared the spices and they prepared their hearts. They prepared their hearts to return to the tomb of Christ. And they were so desirous of going that they could not wait for the sun to rise. And in fact, they went while it was still dark because they were going to experience more than the sun of this world rising. They were going to see the rising of the sun of justice. Matthew tells us in his Gospel in chapter 28 that there was a great earthquake A great earthquake. And an angel appeared and rolled the stone away in chapter 28, verses 1 and 2. Why was the angel there to roll the stone away? Because Jesus could not get out of the tomb and needed the assistance of the angel? The fathers tell us no. St. Peter Chrysologus says, An angel descended and rolled back the stone. He did not roll back the stone to provide a way of escape for the Lord, but to show the world that the Lord had already risen. He rolled back the stone to help His fellow servants believe, not to help the Lord rise from the dead. He rolled back the stone for the sake of faith, because it had been rolled over the tomb for the sake of unbelief. He rolled back the stone so that He rolled back the stone so that he who took death captive might hold the title of life. Pray, brothers, that the angel would descend now and roll away all the hardness of our hearts and open up our closed senses and declare to our minds that Christ has risen. For just as the heart, for just as the heart in which Christ lives and reigns is heaven, so also the heart in which Christ remains dead and buried is a grave. May it be believed that just as He died, so was He transformed. Christ the man suffered. He died and was buried. As God, He lives and reigns and will reign forevermore. We notice one other point in the Gospel of Matthew. Actually, two important points that we have to to take with us before we move to the other Gospels. First, notice in chapter 28, verse 7. The angels say, Then go quickly and tell His disciples that He is risen from the dead. And behold, He is going before you to Galilee. There you will see Him. Lo, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. And here is an account that only Matthew tells us about. And behold, while they were running to the apostles, Jesus met them and said, Hail. And they came up and took hold of His feet and worshipped Him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell My brethren to go to Galilee. There they will see Me. For the sake of time, I'm going to show you in verse 16 right here. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus directed them. I want you to hold on to that and we're going to come back to it. You're told twice to go to tell the disciples to go to Galilee. Galilee is up north. We'll look at it in a, in a few minutes. We encounter here for our first real difficulty or divergence in the text. 
Matthew tells us they ran to tell the disciples. But Mark tells us that they said no one to nothing to anyone. And Luke confirms that they indeed, indeed go, did go and tell the eleven and all the rest. The fathers of the church explained that they were filled with both joy and fear at the same time. The soldiers were like dead men on the ground, realized that they didn't know that the soldiers had been sent to guard the tomb. Women coming while it was still dark. Soldiers around the tomb lying there dead. The angels showed brighter than anything they had ever seen. The no one that the fathers tell us were those at the tomb. That the women did not speak to the soldiers. They did not speak to the angels. They did not even dare speak among themselves. But confused, terrified, and afraid, they went running for the upper room where there was safety. As I said, Matthew gives us this unique appearance at this moment of Jesus appearing to the women and tells us that they fell on the ground and grabbed hold of Him and worshipped Him. St. John Chrysostom says, After they had departed with fear and joy, Jesus met them saying, Hail! They ran to Him with great joy and gladness and they took hold of His feet. Thus they received by His touch an irrefutable proof of His resurrection with full personal assurance of it. And they worshipped Him. What does He then say? Do not be afraid. Again, Jesus Himself casts out their fear, making room for faith. Go and tell My brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see Me. Note well how He Himself sends good tidings to His disciples by these women. He thereby brings honor to women, as I have so often said, honor to that sex which is most prone to be dishonored. At the time, Jesus raises them up. Through these women, He brings good hope and the healing of that which is diseased. Some among you may desire to be like these faithful women. You too may wish to take hold of the feet of Jesus. You can, even now. You can embrace not only His feet, but also His hands and even His sacred head. You too can re today receive these awesome mysteries which are pure with a pure conscience. You can embrace Him not only in this life, but also even more fully on that day when you shall see Him coming with unspeakable glory, with a multitude of angels, if you are so disposed along with Him to be compassionate. You shall hear not only these words, all hail, but also those others, come you blessed of My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world." The Gospel in the Gospel of Matthew. That's his commentary in the Gospel of Matthew. There is another divergence which is more difficult to resolve. Was Mary Magdalene with these women? Or was she separate? There is no good answer to this dilemma. Except if we take the empty tomb and the angels to be an appearance of the Lord. Mark tells us that He appeared first to Mary Magdalene. And John follows the same path, but Matthew says He appeared to the women. And Luke names those women and includes Mary Magdalene. But it is Mary Magdalene in the Gospel of John that runs to Peter and John and says they have taken the body of the Lord. The tomb is empty. In the Gospel of Luke, the women arrive at the upper, t upper room announcing the appearance and they are in an absolute uproar. And then Peter ran, ran to the tomb. I, my own theory is that Mary, Mary Magdalene, having come to the tomb with the other women, was so moved, she ran ahead of the others. She left the group immediately on seeing the tomb empty and went and told Peter and John. And the account of John's Gospel then proceeds. And while all of this is taking place, Jesus appears to the women and then to Mary Magdalene in different places 
but at the same time. Regardless, the whole situation must have been absolutely crazy. Crying, even screaming, what is going on? The Jews have stolen his body. The guards, the soldiers are all around the tomb, but they appear as dead. They're rushing in and trying to tell their own version of what they saw take place. And what is the result? In a number of Gospels, we learn that the apostles did not believe. Mark tells us that they simply did not believe the women. These words, Luke tells us, seem to them to be idle tales. The fathers are unanimous in seeing in this context the restoration of the fall. Whereas Eve was believed by Adam and humanity fell, now the men do not trust the word of the woman. However, the fathers also see in this the mercy of God. Whereas Eve had spoken a word of deceit to Adam, now she becomes the bearer of the saving word of God. In fact, Mary Magdalene is called by the church the apostle to the apostles. St. Leo the Great, speaking of this doubt in the heart of the apostles, says the spirit of truth would by no means have permitted this hesitation, wavering in human weakness, to enter the hearts of his preachers if their tre trembling anxiety and questioning delay were not to have established the foundations of our faith. Consequently, it was our doubts and our danger that was being considered in the apostles. We, in the guise of the apostles, were being instructed against the slanders of the wicked and the proofs of earthly wisdom. Their seeing instructed us. Their hearing informed us. Their touching strengthened us. Let us give thanks for the divine plan and the necessary slowness of the Holy Fathers. They doubted so that we might not need to doubt. In the Gospel of John, chapter 20, if you want to turn there, you can. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to re recall it for you. In the Gospel of, uh, of John, we hear of Mary Magdalene and going to the tomb and running to Peter and John. Running back, John outruns Peter, but waits and Peter goes in first. Mary Magdalene then trailing behind. You can imagine, it's a, not an easy run through the streets of Jerusalem while it is still dark, she has run to the tomb. She has run back to the upper room. And now she runs to the tomb again out of breath. She trails behind, but then she arrives. And there she weeps at the tomb. St. Augustine tells us that the eyes that had sought for the Lord and had not found Him were now free for tears grieving more that he had been taken away from the sepulcher than that he had been slain on the wooden cross, since now not even a memorial place was left behind. You remember that Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene as a gardener. And you remember it was Adam and Eve's job in the beginning to till paradise. Dom Prosper Garage says, on that great Easter day, Magdalene, like a morning star, announced the rising of the Son of Justice who was never more to set. Woman, said Jesus to her, why weepest thou? Thou art not mis mistaken, he seemed to say. It is indeed the divine gardener speaking to thee, the same that planted Eden in the, Eden in the beginning. But now dry thy tears in this new garden, whose center is an empty tomb. Paradise is restored. The angels no longer close the entrance. Here is the tree of life, which is born fruit these three days past. It would be later that day that we find out that Jesus appears to Peter. You can just write the note down. Luke chapter 24, verse 33. 24 verse 33 and 1 Corinthians 15 verses 5 through 8. I don't need to turn you there because we don't know what happened. We just know that he appeared to Peter. 
both in the account after the road to Emmaus and in 1 Corinthians with St. Paul, we learn that he appeared to Peter, but we know nothing of what transpired. Luke tells us in chapter 24 of Luke, and you can turn there, in, in chapter 24 of the Gospel of Luke, that he appeared later that evening on that same first Easter day, that first Pascha, that he appeared to two on the road to Emmaus. Those two are known to us. Luke tells us in chapter 24, verse 18, that one of them was Cleopas. Cleopas is known by tradition to be the brother of St. Joseph. Jesus' uncle. And tradition also tells us that the second person on that road was Cleopas' son, Simeon, Jesus' cousin, who would become the second bishop of Jerusalem. But you remember, they didn't recognize Jesus, did they, when He appeared? How did they recognize Him finally? In the breaking of the bread. But even before that, something began to happen within them that we only hear about toward the end of the story. It's in verse 32. Once they realized who it was, they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while we talked, while he talked to us on the road, while he opened up to us the Holy Scriptures? Earlier it tells us that he showed them in all of the Scriptures how he had been prepared for. My brothers and sisters, this is a great lesson for us today that the knowledge of the Old Testament as a foundation for understanding the Gospel is critically important. St. Augustine says, "...their eyes were obstructed that they should not recognize Him until the breaking of the bread, and thus in accordance with the state of their minds, which were still ignorant of the truth that the Christ would die and rise again. Their eyes were similarly hindered. It was not that the truth Himself was misleading them, but rather that they were themselves unable to perceive the truth. How true this point is regarding Christians today. Because of a lack of knowledge of the Old Testament, Testament, we are unable to perceive the truth of the Gospel. There's something else though, also, for us to take to account. And that is the aspect of fasting, which allows us to see more keenly the spiritual life. I like to think of fasting as the dial on a radio, okay? That helps us tune into the channel, that opens our eyes to be able to see things which we would not otherwise be able to see. How important preparation is if there is going to be fulfillment. Sadly today, many Christians have thrown away fasting and therefore they are not able to perceive the truth of the resurrected Lord. Later, Jesus would appear to them in Luke chapter 24, verse 36. 24, verse 36. As they were saying this, Jesus Himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened, and supposed that they, that they saw a spirit. And He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do questionings rise in your hearts? See My hands and My feet. See My hands and My feet. That it is I Myself. Handle Me and see. For a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see that I have. John will also give an account of this appearance in his Gospel. St. Jerome tells us that as he showed them real hands and a real side, so he really ate with his disciples. He really walked with Cleopas. This is so important because this is exactly what the Jehovah's Witnesses claim didn't happen. They say, well, he appeared to be in his body, but wasn't really in his own body. There's nothing new under the sun. 
the Jehovah's Witnesses and the heresies that are present today were present at the time of St. Jerome. He showed them real hands and real side, so he really ate with his disciples. He really walked with Cleopas, conversed with them with a real tongue, really reclined at supper, with real hands took bread, blessed and broke it, and offered it to them. Do not put the power of the Lord on the level of tricks of magicians, so that he may appear to have been what he was not and made to be thought to have eaten without teeth, walked without feet, broken bread without hands, spoken without a tongue, and showed a side which had no ribs. There is a final appearance that we do not have account of in the Scriptures, which I will just simply mention for your own edification, and that is the tradition that Mary, the mother of God, was the first to receive the news of the resurrection. It is known among the fathers at least as early as the 5th century. And uh, a number of great saints have also believed in this tradition, including Pope St. John Paul II. In John chapter 20, let's look at John chapter 20 we hear of the final appearance of Jesus in Jerusalem before He goes to Galilee. And it's very fascinating. Chapter 20, verse 26. And you know the story well. He appears to Thomas, who was not present at the earlier appearance in the upper room. But notice what the text says. In verse 26, eight days later, that is the following Sunday, eight days from the day of the resurrection. There is a reason why this took place, not only because we begin to understand that Jesus is calling his followers to gather on the day of the resurrection, but there is a further reason. Virgil Pixner brings us back to the earlier point that I was mentioning about the Feast of Weeks and the offering of the sheaf, the first fruits. According to the sequence of the feasts, as the Pharisees and the temple priests understood them from the precepts of the Torah, on this first immediate day of Passover, the first sheaves of grain harvest were brought to the temple, waved there by the altar, and presented as an offering of the first crop of the year. You can, if you're writing notes, write down Leviticus 23, verse 15. Leviticus 23, 15. The sheaf of offering is called an omer in Hebrew, and the entire period of counting is called the counting of the omer. So right now we are in the time period of the counting of the omer. The feast at the end of this period is called the Feast of Weeks because it concludes the seven weeks of counting. The words of the Torah, count from the day after the Sabbath, were interpreted in different ways. The Sadducees began counting the 50 days on the Sunday following the Sabbath within Passover week. The Pharisees considered the first day of Passover on which the Seder is celebrated in the Hebrew. Feast days are are also called Sabbaths. The Pharisees considered it to be be that Sabbath and began counting from the first intermediate day as is done by the Jews today. Since in that year, Passover fell on a Sabbath, there was no dispute between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and both groups could perform the Feast of Sheaf Waving without any dispute. But the Essenes, where the upper room was located, had a different calendar. The Sabbath following the seven days of Passover was the day that was meant in the Torah they began to count the Omer on the Sunday five days after their Passover week was over. Consequently, the Essenes celebrated their Feast of Weeks one week later than the Pharisees and Sadducees. Since the Essenes did not take any part in the temple service, they probably performed a ceremony similar to the Omer offering within their own communities on Mount Sion, around the upper room where the apostles were living and where Jesus would appear on that day. In the neighborhood of Jesus' supper room 
where the Essenes, where the Essenes counting was predominant, they assembled after the Passover week for the feast of the sheaf offering. And there Jesus came in the midst of his apostles who were celebrating now with the Essene community the feast of first fruits. And Jesus again put himself in the midst of that feast, showing himself to be the fulfillment of the Old Testament feasts. As I showed you in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus told the women, and the angel also told the women, to tell the apostles to go to Galilee. Okay, It's about a, uh, a three or four day journey. And he's told to go to the mountain where Jesus directed them to go. But my brothers and sisters, what is the only account we have of Jesus appearing in Galilee? Was he on a mountain? At the seashore, right? When Peter jumps off the boat and goes swimming for the Lord. But there is another account. There is another account of the resurrection. And that is given to us by St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So let's turn there. Look at verse 3. For I delivered to you as the first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then He appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive. This is very important because we know that that 1 Corinthians was written prior to the Gospel texts. This is the oldest account that we have of what took place. And notice the antiquity because it mentions that many of them are still alive who had seen what had taken place. 500 brethren at one time, most of them are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then he appeared to, the, to all the apostles and he ascended into heaven. That's what we have to cover in the next 30 seconds. Okay? So, now you remember, Jesus tells them to go to Galilee. He tells them to go there. But in this story, in the Gospel of John, do they recognize him? Are they surprised? Absolutely. Because Jesus told them not to go fishing, he told them to get up on the mountain. And yet they did not go up on the mountain. They went fishing on their own. And so Jesus went here to the place He knew where they would be. Not only because He was God, but because that's the same place that He called them. It's the same place they washed their nets. It's the same place they fished every single morning. It was the same place they were fishing again. And Jesus stood right there on this step. It's still in location today. You can stand there. And He looked down at the water and could see the fish. And he said, toss your net to the other side. And Peter, realizing that it was the Lord, jumped off of the boat and went swimming for land. And what did Jesus do? He prepared a charcoal fire. Why? When is the last time Peter saw a charcoal fire? When he denied him three times. And what will Jesus ask him three times? Do you love me? While Peter and the others went out fishing, Jesus went fishing for men and caught Peter in his net. And Peter, jumping into the water, was brought to the seashore at the hand of the Lord. And there... In front of the charcoal fire, the Lord roasted him, if you will, over the fire of divine love. Do you love me, Peter? Is your heart on fire for me, Peter? Three times Jesus would ask him, do you love me? And the Greek word that Jesus uses has an aspect of sacrificial love. Peter are you willing to die with me like you said you were? And Peter responds, not with sacrificial love. He uses the word phileo, brotherly love, a lower level, not as dedicated. 
Are you willing to sacrifice your life for me, Peter? Do you love me that much? Not that much, Lord. Do you love me, Peter? Are you willing to sacrifice your life for me, Peter? I said I could once, Lord, and I failed you. I have phileo love for you, Lord. A third time, Jesus asks him, do you love me? And lowers the level. Do you at least have phileo love for me, Peter? And Peter wept. He knew what had taken place. In that Gospel, Jesus will tell us that Peter would eventually be bound and would be carried to a place that he would not otherwise go. And, G and Peter certainly would be bound to be crucified and carried not by his own strength, but by the strength of Jesus to the cross. This is the same location and above it, a mountain. This is the mountain of Jesus. This is where Jesus loved to go. There's a beautiful cave right here he loved to pray in. And it is here that, the, that he taught thousands on the Mount of Beatitude. It is here that they gathered. You can see a natural place where he could stand and the wind coming off the sea would carry his voice to this natural amphitheater. That is the traditional location where Christians have always believed that Jesus met His apostles on the mountain. And let me ask you, if Jesus appeared and said, go to the mountain that I am directing you to go, what would you ask next? No, you wouldn't ask which mountain because you know the mountain. When? When? Exactly, Bob. Why is it that 500 people assembled themselves and Jesus appeared to them? Because the apostles knew where and when it would take place. And the word spread and people flocked to that place where they had come to see Jesus before. And there He appeared to the 500. And the next account 1 Corinthians gives, the last one before the ascension, is his appearance to James. James would become, James the brother of the Lord, would become the first bishop of Jerusalem. As I said, well actually I didn't say this, I talked about Cleopas and Simon, his uncle and cousin. It is believed that James was indeed the brother of the Lord, of St. Joseph, the son of St. Joseph from a previous marriage. If you haven't heard that tradition, do know that it is the most ancient tradition of the church, known by all of the church fathers, that Joseph was an older man who took Mary to protect her, and that he had a son, James, which is why the icon depicts James. Here we have Hagios Joseph, Holy Joseph. And here we have Holy James, the brother of the Lord making their way to Egypt the Holy Family. Father Pixner says that he, he guesses that Jesus most, must have told them something the midpoint of the feast. Counting the 50 days, on the 25th day, meet me on that mountain and I will reveal myself to you there. St. Jerome says that there was in his day an apocryphal gospel called the Gospel of the Hebrews, which he translated and in that Gospel, it says that when the Lord had handed over the linen cloth to the priest's servants, He went to James and appeared to him. For James had made an oath to eat no bread after he had drunk the cup of the Lord until he saw Him risen from those who sleep. And shortly thereafter, the Lord said to him, Bring a table here with bread. Right after that, He adds, He took bread spoke the blessing and gave it to James the just and said, and said to him, My brother, eat your bread, for the Son of Man is risen from those who are asleep. In the Gospel of Luke, as I showed you before, it says that he led them out in Jerusalem. He led them out to Bethany. 
I should have said this appearance to James took place in Jerusalem. He returned from Galilee to Jerusalem where James was to be bishop. And then he gathered his apostles to him and led them out as far as Bethany. I showed you that slide earlier of Bethany where Lazarus was raised from the dead. It is the mountaintop of the Mount of Olives. Turn with me to Luke chapter 24, verse 50. And you'll see the text there. Then he led them out as far as Bethany and lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and it was carried up to heaven. Turn finally to Acts chapter 1, the account of the ascension. Chapter 1, verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said this, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. A 5th century Greek text, the author is unknown. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us keep it with gladness and rejoicing. Why should we do so? Because the sun is no longer darkened. Instead, everything is bathed in light. This is the day in the truest sense, the day of triumph. This is the day on which Adam was set free and Eve delivered from her affliction. It is the day on which cruel death shuddered. The strength of hard stones was shattered and destroyed. The bars of the tombs were broken and set aside. It is the day on which the bodies of people long dead were restored to their former life. And the laws of the underworld, hitherto ever powerful and immutable, were repealed. It is the day on which the heavens were opened at the rising of Christ the Lord, and on which for the good of the human race, the flourishing and fruitful tree of the resurrection sent forth branches all over the world, as if the world were a garden. It is the day on which the lilies of the newly enlightened sprang up, and the streams that sustained sinners ran dry. The strength of the devil drained away, and demonic armies were scattered. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.